Hello everyone and welcome for another video of Love and War Games. In this video, we will take a look at the latest release for the Crown, which is the Gloriana Battlefleet set. It is a huge box with a ton of things inside, and especially, of course, the new Crown Dreadnought. So let's have a look at what is inside and how you can build this box and what you can do with it. First, I just want to remind for the newer players here, what is the playstyle of the Crown? The Crown is a very standard faction, it doesn't have a lot of tricks. Uh, they are a little bit more defensive oriented, especially they have uh, quite tough armor citadel and they have rules to not be as degraded when they start to get crippled. Uh, they are quite good with default weaponries, especially, especially torpedoes, even though they have some boost uh, for the gun batteries as well. Uh, they have a very unique Guardian Generators, which is something we'll talk about especially here. Uh, I will say it here, Guardian Generators mean that you have a pool of Guardian Points that are generated at the beginning of each turn, and you can choose when you get attacked to spend some or none of these points to reduce the firepower of your opponent. And this is extremely useful because uh, when you start to make statistics, you can really just spend enough Guardian Points to cancel the worst effect that your enemy could have. And when you start to play good with the Guardian Points, it's really, really efficient. So it's very important and we'll have a look because one of the newer ships plays with these mechanics. And so what do we get inside? The first thing that we are going to notice is that it is more expensive than the Crown Starter Set which was at 60 points and had a, a similar amount of content. It had a smaller main ship, that is true. The Britannia is smaller than the Gloriana, like quite uh, smaller. Uh, but it was uh, cheaper, this box, and it had dices and cards and everything. That is because the starter set was an extremely good deal. Like it was really like something like very cheap to say like, hey, come and try this game. And the Gloriana is more for players that have already tried the game and like, okay, I know I want to plunge inside Dystopian Wars and I want the very, very cool ships uh, for my games. So it is a little bit more expensive, but you still do get a lot of values. I mean, look at everything that you've got in this set. It is still a lot. Uh, the main attraction here is, of course, going to be this huge piece of resin, the Gloriana Battlefleet set. Uh, by the time you watch this video, there will be the unboxing of the Gloriana uh, release, so have a look if you want to see uh, how big it is. Uh, spoiler, it is very big. Uh, there are th three variants that you can build it as. Uh, you can have the standard Gloriana, the Camelot, which is more like the th ship that plays with Guardian Points, or the Adventurer, which is quite unique because it unlocks an entire subfaction. And this is very interesting, we'll talk about it later. You also have four, and yes, I say four, <laughs> British frontline cruisers. That is a lot. You have eight Caliburn frigates, which is <laughs> maybe a little bit more than you want. <laughs> like, you, I'm sure you will play them all, but it's good to have a lot of them. Uh, especially since the crown doesn't have escort tokens, you can use them as. You have two Pride and War Rotors with these huge ships, uh, flying ships in the rear. Beautiful ships. They look small here, but trust me, they are very big. Uh, you have two Tintagel Battle Rotors and four Saxon Scott Rotors, which are the smaller aircraft slash uh, bombers that you can see. You also have, and it's uh, surprisingly enough uh, to be noted, uh, you also have a quick let starter book, which gives you the profile, the building instructions. Uh, you have all of this in paperback, so I know some people wanted to have this, and it is now in the book, uh, in the box, so I wanted to specify it here. Okay, so let's have a look what you can build these ships as. And we need to talk first about the Gloriana Dreadnought. Uh, this thing is, first of all, big, and it is very, very impressive. Uh, first thing that you will notice is that this, thi this uh, thing is 350 points when you look at the profile, which is like amazing, like it's a huge point cost. And the thing that is a bit surprising, it is Armor 8 Citadel 16, so no more than the Britannia, uh, the battleship that was in the starter box. And it has 10 hull points in battle ready and 5 hull points in crippled. Which means that it is only 2 hull points more resilient than the Britannia. So that is uh, not uh, in the favor of the Gloriana. However, however, <laughs> this thing, as you can see in the picture, is literally bristling with weapons. Uh, it is like it has 4 heavy gun batteries and it has 4 uh, smaller gun batteries. So of course you cannot uh, use all of them against the same enemy, especially the smaller gun, uh, gun batteries uh, don't have a perfect angle. But if you do manage to have an enemy on your left and an enemy on your right, between the heavy broadside and all the gun batteries that you'll be able to link, like you can reliably sink 
two smaller cruisers, like two mass two cruisers per turn, one on the left, one on the right. Like this thing is just devastating. Uh, they are also an upgrade you can have for these heavy gun batteries. You can buy the Majestic gun batteries upgrade, uh, which is good. We'll talk about it right now. These means that they uh, gain extreme range and they also have better uh, linking value, uh, support value, sorry, uh, when you get uh, at uh, long range and thus at extreme range. Uh, it is a bit expensive and we'll talk about uh, how to play the Gloriana in a second, but it's something to keep in the mind. Uh, one thing that I want to say about the Gloriana is that it is, uh, what I would say, I would call it more of a glass cannon than the Britannia. Uh, it's a bit weird to call something like Armor 8, Citadel 16 and Talon Hall points a glass cannon. Uh, I understand it's very tough, but for the point cost, it is more fragile than the Britannia, which is why I uh, allow myself to make this kind of analogy. Like, it's more offensive oriented than the Britannia, let's say. So if your opponent really wants to sink it, uh, and you don't use uh, Guardian Points to protect it, uh, then it can go down relatively fast. Let's not get crazy, it's not gonna get sunk at the first cruiser that shoots at it, uh, but it is uh, more made to deal damages and do a lot of damage than to tank all the enemy's firepower. Uh, this is why it is extremely efficient when you put it in strategic reserve, because it means it will uh, arrive at turn two, yes, but it will arrive exactly uh, how it wants. And uh, this is a very good way to play the Gloriana. I understand that some people want to have it on the board turn one because it's such a beautiful ship, and we'll talk about how to do it in a second. But if you put it in strategic reserve, it means on turn two when it arrives, uh, you will be able to put it exactly where you want to be, and ideally, you will put it so it rams a ship as soon as it arrives because it moves uh, quite a little bit. It will ram a ship, and ideally, you want after the ramming action to have a ship on your right uh, and a ship on your left. I mean, your starboard, your port side, like, but left and right, let's say. And this way you can really maximize your entry at turn two. And you can really devastate a ship by ramming and then boarding. And also use your firepower uh, left and right to really cripple the enemy fleet. And this will be a very, very efficient uh, action. If you put an Albion attached as well and some other ships in support, this can really be like an assault that just obliterates the enemy fleet uh, quite, quite a lot. And once it is there, like we do know ships that like to go in strategic reserve because they're very fragile um, and then they die. But here, like it will be very efficient, it will do a lot of damage, and then it's just gonna be here in the middle of the enemy fleet uh, that it's already quite crippled, and uh, it will be very difficult to deal uh, for your opponent. So, very good ship to put it in strategic reserves. Uh, if you want to have it uh, on the board turn one, then I would recommend, of course, to give it Majestic Gun Batteries. It can have four Majestic Gun Batteries, which is quite a lot. Uh, you can, of course, give it heavy firepower and everything. Uh, great. Uh, then it's good, like especially if your fleet is more like long-range oriented. It means your uh, Gloriana can just stay in the back uh, for the first turn and wait for the enemy to come. Uh, you make a couple turns like this at, uh, with a lot of uh, extreme-range firepower between torpedoes that the Crown Love and the Gloriana. Uh, the enemy will have to come close, and then the Gloriana is still a beast, and it, it, is, it can work really well as well. In any case, I would always recommend to attach an Albion. Uh, it's quite cheap, and it will always give a good bonus. Of course, give the same weapons of, to the Albion as the Gloriana. I mean, if you give... Uh, what did the name? Uh, uh, Majestic Gun Batteries to the Gloriana, of course, give it to the Albion as well. And also put Escorts, because uh, why not? It will make the Gloriana a little bit less of a glass cannon. <laughs> well, let's just say it's going to make it even tankier. Okay, let's put it like that. Another variant that you can build is the Camelot Eye Guardian. I've seen on the booklet and the box that is called Camelot. I think it's a mistake, because uh, like I will keep calling it Camelot. It sounds better. Um... Uh, what is the Camelot? Well, it's also a very tough ship. Uh, it costs a little bit more. Uh, I mean, it costs 10 points uh, more than the Gloriana. It's going to be at 360 points. It's also a very good Dreadnought, but for different reasons. It costs a little... Like, it loses a little bit of firepower. It loses one heavy gun battery to the rear. Okay. It loses... It loses all four uh, smaller gun batteries. Uh, that is more annoying indeed. However, it keeps inspirational, <laughs> whatever, uh, but it wants to stay in the middle of the fleet, so it's kind of fine. But the thing you buy the Camelot for is the Guardian Generator points that it uh, creates every turn. Basically, like every turn, I don't know if you can see the uh, cursor, but it has eight Guardian <laughs> Generators all around there. So it will create eight 
guardian points per turn, like just like that, and nothing your opponent can do, which is huge, like it's quite a lot. And then you can make a valor effect to turn this 8 points into 16 points. Of course, it's so crazy that your opponent can always try to intercept this, and he will uh, burn cards to intercept this, because 16 guardian points, it means that you are basically invulnerable for this turn. I'm exaggerating a bit, but it's really, really a lot. So it will force your opponent to burn one or two cards, which is always really good. And in, if you do get the Camelot, I would recommend to use a Majestic Gun Batteries, because the Camelot is... It can do some damage, especially with three uh, Majestics at extreme range with or without heavy firepower. But if you do the, like if you buy the Camelot, you want it to be in the rear because it will attract a lot of firepower from your opponent. So maybe, yeah, stay a little bit in the back and you, this way you can use Inspirational as well. And it's quite good. The thing that is even better, and this is quite gross, is there is a named variant of the Camelot, which is the HMCS Tilok Galt, I guess. Uh, how to pronounce that? Uh, it costs the same, okay. It uh, becomes Canadian, so there are a few rules changes, especially it gains Ablative Front Armor, which is huge, and Vulnerable Stern. It means that probably it doesn't want to point that much its rear, maybe like starting on turn 2, it will just keep its front pointed to the enemy. Uh, but if it does that, it gains Ablative Front Armor, which means the first 4 uh, explosives of your opponent will be cancelled. Which, because you are mass 4. Uh, this is quite huge. Like, this makes the Camelot significantly tankier. Uh, but you gain vulnerable start, so be careful. And uh, so, let's remember that it costs the same <laughs> amount as the normal Camelot. And what does it gain as well? It gains command codes. Command codes means that once per turn, per turn, I insist, you get a full reroll for a unit uh, in range of this ability, which is like 10 inches, if I remember correctly. Uh, that's absolutely insane. And uh, it can give it to himself. Uh, and but even then, like just full reroll each turn, it's crazy. The, it's one of the bonus of the battle fleet that you can gain, and it's one per game when you unlock it through a battle fleet. Here, around the uh, Tilok Galt, it will be once per turn. Uh, I cannot insist how strong this is, and this is on top of all the Guardian generator points, etc. Uh, I, I would say, like if you do have some ships to make a Canadian battle fleet. Uh, I would highly, highly recommend to always play the Camelot as this Canadian version uh, every time. Yes, you do lose some uh, things, especially like um, Lionhearted Crew and uh, the Royal Engineers can help with your firepower, eh? fine, whatever. But you gain so much from this and I would recommend to do this and expect it to go a little bit higher in points in the future. But even if it gains like another 10 points, it's still absolutely going to be worth it just for the command codes. And the ability front armor, which is also crazy on the mass force ships. Last variant that you can go, and that last ship that we will see in detail, is the Adventurer Grand Indiaman. This ship does a little bit of everything. Uh, it, it also costs 360 points, okay. It also loses uh, heavy gun batteries compared to the Gloriana. And it has only uh, two Guardian uh, generators, which is like, ah, not so great, not so great. But what do you gain uh, out of this? Uh, the first thing that you can see, even before talking about the East Indian Trade Company, uh, is that you gain a lot of support. You gain logistical support, so extra card, supply depot, so you can reload things around and remove disorders and stuff, and useful freight, which is, uh, again, something good to uh, play with your cards. Uh, this is just great all around. Like It's a very good support ship on top of being like still a very, very powerful uh, dreadnought. And uh, I like it a lot. I, I mean, between this and the Camelot, I'm not sure which one I want to build. Or even the Gloriana is good. Like, I mean, all the three ships are very good in different ways, which is always very good. And the thing that is very interesting with the Adventurer is that when you buy it, like, you need to put it in the East India Trade Company battle fleet, and it unlocks the sub-faction. Uh, this uh, sub-faction used to be a bit uh, not so good. It has a very powerful bonus, but the bonus of the East Indian Trade Company uh, used to be, the main bonus, used to be that you need to have uh, more victory points than your opponent at the beginning of the turn, uh, which is like, okay, sure. Uh, but the, it used to be very underwhelming because I mean the first turn, which is usually quite important, you don't have this bonus and you don't have the British bonuses that you would have, etc., etc. And you are dependent on having the on starting the game strong and gaining a lot of victory points on the first turn. It's like, eh, I'm not sure it was so good. However, the very very interesting thing that happens is that now there is this new patron system, which is let's call it sub factions for the game, like sub sub factions, which can give you bonuses uh, if you choose a patron. 
for the whole fleet. However, you gain you give victory points to your opponent uh, even before the game begins, like at the beginning of the first turn. Which means that if you are the East Inter Train Company player and you don't take a patron and your opponent does, you will have more victory points than your opponent at the start of the first turn, and then you will unlock your very, very powerful bonus uh, from the start. Plus you also have a uh, this capacity to keep some victory gear cards after you play them. Like they really play good with the cards of the version of the game, and it's very interesting. However, we need to see some patrons. Like, is it going to be such a bummer to not have any patrons, or can you play without? Just thinking like, wait, well, I want the bonus and uh, whatever about patrons, or is it really, really difficult to play without them because they give such uh, big bonuses? We will see. But if they only give one victory point to the opponent, for example, and they are not so strong, it is very, very interesting to have the Adventure Grand Indiaman because the East India Trenched Company is going to be a great sub-faction. Uh, regarding on how to play it, uh, I would recommend to keep it cheap. Like, it's not supposed to be a, a beast. Maybe give it majestic uh, gun batteries to the front if you want, or maybe all three of them can work. Of course, give it an Albion, it's always good. Uh, same deal as before, give it the same weapon, etc. Uh, I would recommend to give it weapons, uh, escorts, because it's really going to take a lot of firepower from the opponent, because it gives a lot, like logistical support, supply depot, and useful freight are all important capacities, so your opponent will want to sink it. And uh, it really wants to have a source of fortunes of war in the fleet, because you're going to have a lot of cards, and you play good with cards, so you have good cards in your game hand like it's always going to be great so you want a source of fortunes of war in the fleet uh, because this will combo very good with the, all the cards that you're going to get and you will really have mastery over the card aspect of the game uh, for the the battle where you will bring an adventure grand india man so another very good ship and again like the three versions are very interesting the gloriana the camelot and the adventurer uh, I'm not sure which one I would recommend. Depends on what you want to do uh, with the rest of the fleet. Uh, do you have a theme in mind, etc., etc. Ideally, maybe try to magnetize as much as possible. But let's be honest. Like, even if you don't have it like WYSIWYG, uh, you can just uh, they keep the same frame, let's say. So if you have it as, I don't know, a Camelot, and uh, you say to your opponent, okay, this time, this uh, game, I'm going to play it as an adventurer, uh, it's going to be fine. Like, they... Uh, I think even in the tournament, they have exactly the same shape and uh, size. And as long as it's uh, well written at the beginning of the game, uh, it's going to be fine, I'm pretty sure. So even if you don't magnetize this, this uh, ship specifically, uh, I think you can proxy one as the other very, very easily. Okay, and then we go to the uh, British Frontline Cruisers. You get four of them, let's remember. And so, yeah, what can you get? Uh, the first thing you have is the Albion. Uh, it's a good ship, it's reliable, it has armor 6, it has 12 and 4 hull points both in battle ready and crippled, quite classic. However, it has two things that make it interesting. First of all, it has an internal guardian generator, always good to take. Uh, it has torpedoes, blah, blah. and the thing that makes it very interesting, it can be attached to a British flagship. And that is very good, especially, again, when we consider the Gloriana, for example. Uh, I would always recommend to attach one Albion to a Gloriana or Camelot or whichever variant you want, uh, because it's a good ship, they will boost each other very well, and they can link their torpedoes, their heavy gun batteries, their broadsides, like, just a good ship to have around, and they will also protect each other from torpedoes and air attacks better, like, just a good thing to do. And this is why, if you buy this box, and even if it's your first box as the... Uh, crown player, I would recommend to build one Albion always to make this little combo, let's call it. And it's quite important, I would say. It's a good benefit, so always do this. Uh, you can make it in different ways, the Albion. It can uh, be good as a torpedo boat with a torpedo turret to the front. You can give it a majestic gun battery, a great. Uh, to keep it at long range, you can keep it uh, cheap, you can give it a rear a guardian generator, which makes it even like more contributing to the guardian pools. Like just a good ship, just a good ship. Build at least one, and if you want more, it's still a very good decision. Then you have the Lancelot, uh, who looks a little bit better now. Like these are the old uh, small turrets. Now they look better. Uh, have a look in the unboxing. We show the new turrets, uh, small turrets. They look much better now. And uh, the Lancelot is 
tougher than the Albion. It has better Citadel, Citadel 13, and one more hull point, uh, which is uh, actually significant. Like, okay, this is more expensive, but this is a significant boost. And it gains a small gun battery to the front, uh, always very good, especially since they've been boosted, these are small gun batteries. It has Armor Sweep, which can sometimes be good, especially since it has a, a good program. So, interesting to take and it also have heavy broadsides and this is the big one uh, it means that the Lancelot is going to be a very good ship uh, I would recommend maybe to give it a generator to the rear you can keep a gun battery there of course uh, still gonna be good but I like it to have uh, it as a kind of like spur head the Lancelot it will just charge at the enemy with torpedoes uh, both gun batteries to the front and then at closing range uh, sorry at point blank it will start to give broadsides left and right heavy broadsides left and right and this means that for example, two Lancelots are always going to be good, either at the flank pointing toward the center or just like holding the center. They are very good ships, uh, relatively tough, not that expensive, and they will do the job. And uh, yeah, I would recommend one or two Lancelot for sure. One thing that is uh, interesting as well is that you can build the Lancelot as sabers. Uh, they look very, very similar to the Lancelot, uh, but the sabers are actually, it's a pack of two, no more, no less. Uh, and then they become Saber flagships and they gain fortunes of war, uh, which is the big thing. It allows you to cancel your opponent's actions, very important, especially at higher points game. Uh, even more reason to build two Lancelots, because depending on your list, you can play them as basic Lancelots or as Saber flagships. Very good. Uh, fortunes of war is a great uh, capacity. And uh, if you really want to spend a lot of money on your cruiser, but it's still good, you can have three sabers, which means three Lancelots, let's say, uh, and then they can be the named version, the Lord's Hood, and basically it's the same, still three, still they're going to be three um, sabers, which is uh, good, which are good ships, and you gain Fortunes of War, still good, and logistical support, uh, which <laughs> starts to be a lot, and it means you will really control the card aspect of uh, the game. Uh, if you do play the adventurer uh, in Diamant, maybe it's not such a good thing to have the Lord's Hood, uh, especially maybe it's not even compatible because it's a British ship and the adventurer is uh, Indian Trent Company. But yeah, no need to have twice logistical support, but if you don't have the adventurer, it's actually not a bad idea to have the Lord's Hood because it will fulfill your role of fortunes of war and logistical support. And they're a good uh, cruiser, so something to keep in mind. Then we have the smaller versions. Uh, the first thing is going to be the Bedivere, which is the smallest uh, version of the cruiser you can have. Uh, they are quite efficient, especially uh, against air units. And we know there starts to be more and more air units in the game uh, for air refaction because they've been released after release of airships, which is great. I mean, I love airships, they look great. And the Bedivere is good at sinking your opponent's uh, airships. It has a built in heavy rocket battery which means you don't need to pay for it, at 87 points, which is already like fine. And it has Skyfire, uh, which means that uh, it rolls blanks against aerial units innately. So two heavy, like uh, one heavy rocket battery rolling blanks, it's no joke against air units. And if you have like two Bedivere's, they can link together and be very, very efficient. I mean, it's not going to be uh, expensive, and they're really going to threaten your enemies like Zeppelin or Air Cruiser or whatever they have. So I would recommend one or two Bedivere. I know it. I, I recommend everything, but really, like, depends on the role. But Bedivere's are very good, especially against air units, and I would recommend some of it if you can. Like, I mean, <laughs> it starts to be a lot. Maybe buy this box twice, but uh, yeah, they they're very good, and Bedivere's are good if uh, choice. And talking about good choice, like, still, uh, we have the Picton. The Picton has uh, one uh, heavy gun battery and one gun battery to the front. It costs only 90 points. And uh, it is also very good. Wait, what can I say? It is efficient. It costs relatively little. It has good firepower, torpedoes, uh, roadsides, etc. It is, let's consider it as a cheaper uh, Albion. Uh, however, it gets pack Hunter. So if you bring three Picton for 270 points, that is going to pack a punch. Uh, it's going to be easier to pilot than an Albion, for example, because all the firepower is uh, front or oriented. And yeah, a pack of two or three Pictons is going to be your threat. Uh, if you want only one ship, I would recommend an Albion, uh, one ship as a standard cruiser, I mean, uh, because the Albion uh, are going to be better in this, especially since they can be attached. However, if you want to make a large squadron, 
uh, I would recommend Pictons. But then it depends on your how many points you want to invest in cruisers. Do you want a Lancelot or even Lord's Hood, which are very expensive but very good? Or do you want a cheaper thing like Pictons, but still uh, very, very honorable? If you really want my advice, like you are like, oh, I don't want to choose, what should I do? You have four British frontline cruisers in this box. Uh, I would recommend to make uh, one Albion, of course. I would probably recommend to make two Lancelots, so you can have the option to make them Sabres if you want, and they are still very good. And I would probably recommend to have one Bedivere uh, in your list. It's going to be the cheapest activation you can have with frontline cruisers. And even just one Revolving Blank, it's still going to be a threat against your opponent's air units. Maybe don't look, don't shoot at battleships uh, with this, uh, air battleships, but small cruisers or smaller squadrons uh, are going to be threatened by the Bedivere. Then, what more do you get? You have this beautiful, beautiful ship, I love it. The Pride and War Rotors. It's a mass 2. It is, uh, let's say, relatively fragile, but when you compare it to the surface ship, of course it is fragile, but for an aerial unit, it is tough. It is the same defensive profile as an Albion, except it has one less hull points in its cripple profile. It costs a lot more, of course. It's going to be 120 points instead of 105 for the Albion. Okay, but it is much, much more agile uh, and faster and everything. It is aerial unit, so it's harder for your opponent to shoot at it. It's immune to torpedoes. Even normal weapons consider it a bit further away than it actually is. Uh, it has an internal guardian generator as well. So it's just a good ship. It's basically a more expensive and better Albion. And much, much cooler. Let's be honest with ourselves. Uh, however, uh, it is resilient, but it's maybe better to not put it in the middle of the table uh, because it will not tank as good. Uh, I would recommend it to come uh, on the sides. It's quite fast. It can, of course, fly over islands and stuff. So good in this. Uh, it does get cloud hunting, which means that it's very efficient against enemy uh, aerials. Very good. You can absolutely use it to make uh, air battles against enemy zeppelins and stuff. Very cool. And uh, since it is... Uh, aerial, it's immune to torpedoes, but it can get uh, torpedo turrets. So it's quite fun. Like if you see enemy submarines uh, and they have only torpedoes, you can shoot at them and sink them, and they cannot even try to shoot back at you with torpedoes because, while well, you fly, you're immune to torpedoes. So this can be quite fun, and since you are aerial, you are never uh, blocked with line of sight uh, from normal islands. You can be blocked by aerial terrain, but they are, these are a little bit more rare. So it means that you can really hunt from the skies the enemy submarines that are hiding, the enemy carriers that are trying to stay behind um, behind islands and stuff. And this is also a very good way uh, to use the Pride End. It's to hunt uh, very fragile enemy units that want to be hidden behind the islands. And yeah, well, they cannot hide from aerial units. You can also make a flagship out of it. This is something quite interesting that I wanted to point with the Pride End, is that uh, you can have a British uh, rotor battle fleet with one uh, Pride End becoming a flagship. So it unlocks you some possibilities and it's uh, quite good because yeah, this thing, like just a single Pride End can be a flagship and then unlocking the whole rotor battle fleet. So something to take into consideration uh, because it's, it, it is good, it is very good. And then we finally arrive at the mass ones that you can get. So the mass ones, uh, you get eight Caliburns. <laughs> that is a lot. Uh, the Caliburns, the Caliburns, they used to be very underwhelming. I barely used them as uh, escort tokens. But now, like, okay, they cost a little bit more now at 30 points per frigate, which, uh, okay, it's fine. But they did gain a lot, and uh, now they are now they are worth considering. What made them worth considering? It's two things. First of all, the gun batteries link better. They are now 5-3 instead of 5-2, which means when you start to have a lot of squadrons, a uh, lot of, sorry, a lot of models in a squadron, it really starts to pile up, this plus one dice per uh, linking weapon, supporting weapon that you get. So that is something very interesting. And the Caliburns gain focused gunnery, so plus two dice and rolling blanks. Uh, this starts to make them very efficient at shooting. Plus they get uh, Royal Engineers, so um, they're going to get plus one dice. And it really starts to be a lot. And okay, they are not the best uh, offensive unit. But for 30 points, a pack of, I don't know, four of those, for example, or six of those, uh, it's going to be uh, to be very, very threatening. They do get auxiliary mine layer. So it means that you get one mine per unit, not per model, uh, because it's auxiliary. So I would recommend maybe, maybe to put like two packs of Caliburns, each pack of three or four of them, and you put them on the flank, etc. They're still going to be relatively cheap. I mean, uh, a pack of four ships is going to be 120 points, still cheap. 
And uh, yeah, they're always going to be worth it, I think. And again, the, in the picture, it's the old turret. The new turret looks much better. Then we go to the air mess ones. We have the Sexon. Very, very fast. Uh, the, like it has Vanguard, Linear Dash, Power Slide. It goes anywhere it wants, the Sexon. Uh, speed 10, turn 8. I mean, this thing is more like an aircraft than a, a cruiser. Like it, it just goes so fast. Uh, it is better at hunting aerial units uh, because it has skyfire and some rocket batteries so it's very good at hunting enemy air units otherwise yeah it's not so great uh, apart from this i tried it against like normal surface units and it's like meh but if the enemy has uh, aerials it's very good for going very fast against them and shooting them and bringing them down the tintagel then is a transport uh, it's a little bit uh, it's still a mess one, so it can be destroyed in one time for, if you breach the citadel. And uh, it's a bit weird. It has uh, air transport, which is good. It, we don't have the rules yet for uh, attacking islands, but maybe it's going to be good later. I mean, it, it is fast, so it's probably going to be efficient. Uh, it has rear torpedoes, which is a bit boring. Like, I mean, how do you use it? It's very difficult to use. However, it starts to have a lot of weapons uh, for such a small ship. Uh, it has a rocket battery, it has torpedoes, it has broadsides, and it's very fast, which means that uh, if you do manage to go like a little bit behind the enemy lines, uh, this thing can really go exactly where the opponent doesn't want you to be, and the enemy will have trouble turning, etc., and you can be in their rear and really do what you want. And then uh, I did, like, if you watch the latest uh, battle report we've released, this thing can really be like an uh, AC-130, like just a gunship obliterate things, uh, left and right with torpedoes and rocket and broadsides and it can just provide like close air support with the maximum uh, efficiency and they are fragile i mean they get sunk fast but again uh, the objective is that they don't get into the line of fire and then they can really be efficient if they arrive uh, where they can be really annoying uh, for your opponent to deal with and i wanted to uh make a little note about how to expand uh, with this fleet it's not something we do usually for the normal battle fleet sets uh, it's what i started to do with the how to start videos but i thought for the gloriana it could be interesting like okay you're a new crown player you want to start with this great uh, gloriana battle fleet set uh, how do you expand from there well the first thing that i would recommend of course is the crown starter set because it's going to give you a little bit more of the same uh, but especially it's going to give you like a second uh, battleship, the Britannia, which is much tankier. Uh, it allows you to use your Gloriana or Avalon Camelot, I'm sorry, Gloriana or Camelot or Adventurer as more like a hammer and the Britannia can be a very, very good anvil. You have more frontline cruisers and more Caliburns. It's going to make it uh, to um, six frontline cruisers. So now you can be a little bit more uh, like an uh, chill about okay i can make like a couple lancelots a couple betty veers a couple pictons like you can really be more chill about that you have even more caliburns uh again maybe use the caliburns for now as escort they work very well as escort tokens uh, you get also and this is new you get also support cruisers uh, you have the artillery version which is for now not so great but can help you have the entire and shredding defense version, which is the Athel Sand, which is very good, especially if you want to focus on torpedo games. But it's also a very good anti airship and uh, anti SRS ship. And uh, finally, you have the uh, SRS support through the Hotspur, which is a small aircraft carrier. Uh, quite good to trigger spotter, and they're fine. Like They're a bit underwhelming, but whatever. Uh, I would recommend if you do get this box to build them as uh, the Athel Sand, the anti air and defense shredding ship. Uh, it's just such a good ship, I would recommend. You also have two Morgana submarines. Uh, those things, I, I just love them. They look great. They have good torpedo uh, game and they can uh, ram the uh, opponent very, very efficiently. Either in strategic reserve or uh, in the rear to shoot torpedoes and threaten your opponents with ramming. Uh, both are very good ways to play Morgana and they are very good ships. And then you have four Excalibur destroyers. Uh, this ship just <laughs> is so efficient. Like, I mean, it's very, very little. It has normal broadside torpedoes, two uh, gun batteries. Uh, it, it is a little bit expensive and fragile, but damn, this thing at the right uh, range is going to obliterate a lot of things. Uh, I love the Excaliburs. For me, they are one of the most efficient ships in the entire Crown roster. Uh, and maybe in the entire game, Excaliburs are great uh, by Excaliburs, but they do require a little bit of um, knowledge on how to play them because they are fragile. But if they get where they want to be and they can cross the T and stuff, 
these things deal so much damage. And you also get SRS tokens, which is good. It's in case you use the uh, Hotspur uh, aircraft carrier, but still good. Another way to expand would be the Avalon Battlefield set. Uh, this, I mean, I love, like, the Avalon is probably my favorite miniature right now in the game. Uh, it looks so good. It's a bit fragile, like, it, it, it is supposed to be on the flight stand, but it's a huge chunk of resin. And I, ha I am having problems to make it hold right now. Uh, so, I, I cannot recommend it wholeheartedly to you uh, for now until I find a solution for this. Uh, but it is a very, very beautiful miniature. It is a great ship, a great aircraft carrier, like flying aircraft carrier. It's cool AF, and uh, yeah, it's just good. You get more Pridens and Saxons and Tintagels and stuff. Uh, and you also get support cruisers and Morganas and Excaliburs. Uh, we talked about all of them so far. It's a very good support box, and I, I have to recommend the Avalon. Like, even if it is a little bit fragile on its flight, on its flight stand, uh, maybe with a little like extra glue or something, you can make it hold. And it's just such a joy to have it on the table. It looks so good. Like <laughs> it, it is just too much beauty in this ship to hold on a single flight stand. <laughs> that is that is it. But it's a very efficient ship. All the things that you get in the box, you want them. Uh, this is of course more oriented towards an air uh, superiority force, but it's very very cool. And uh, yeah, I have to recommend this. And finally, if you want to expand a little bit with a small uh, Canadian force, I would recommend actually the Protector Battlefleet set. Uh, you get another very cool concept, a submarine aircraft carrier, very cool. Uh, there is a great named version that we've uh, showcased on the latest battle report um, for the Protector, and it's so efficient, it's so good and so fun to play. Uh, you also have these Canadian frontline cruisers, which are uh, more like forward-facing uh, firepower than the Albion and the British ships. Uh, than general, they are quite tough, a little bit more expensive, but very tough, and they are pretty massive on the table. They are thick. And you get some submarines as well, Orca submarines. Uh, good pack hunter submarines, and they can also be attached to the Protector. And you get some SLS tokens, even more. And the Canadian uh, battle fleet uh, means that you get some uh, extra free SRS token, even without aircraft carriers. Uh, twice per game, uh, which is also very good. A very good expansion. Uh, it is uh, relatively cheap. It's 45 pounds. I didn't write it down. But it's relatively cheap in terms of uh, pounds and euros and stuff. And it's relatively cheap in terms of points on the table. And it makes a very good thematic addition to your British forces. And there we go. This was how what to build with the Gloriana Battlefleet set. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give us a thumbs up. It really helps us. Uh, tell us what you thought of this video and of the Gloriana Battlefleet set itself in the comments. Uh, I hope it was informative. And if you have any questions, of course, ask them. I will answer them as soon as possible. Until the next video, take care of yourself. Take care of those around you. And remember to keep spreading the love all around. Bye.